I've heard it said that the average person can live for 40 days without food. I'm not volunteering, by the way. I've also heard that they can live eight days without water. You can live four minutes without air, but only seconds without hope. Hmm. Well, we're about to enter two situations in life that could be described as hopeless. It's now reached the point of desperation. I want to follow Luke's gospel account now as we work our way through the gospels chronologically and the ministry of our Lord. Jesus and his disciples have just sailed back across the Sea of Galilee to Capernaum. There's a, there's a massive crowd now waiting for them. We'll begin here in chapter 8 and verse 41. And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue, and falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. As Jesus went, the people pressed around him. Now Luke gives us here uh, this father's, this man's resume so that we don't miss it. He's the ruler of the synagogue. Well, we know from history the high priest managed the temple system, but the synagogues were managed by the local community. The people would elect a synagogue ruler He's sometimes called the president because he presided at public meetings. He would determine the the order of Sabbath worship. He would even be the one selecting a visitor or a member to read scripture during the worship service. So Jairus would be, he'd be one of the most highly respected men there in that Jewish community. By the way, he would also be responsible to warn the assembly of any heresy, any, any false teacher. He would have been aware that Jesus had already been thrown out of one synagogue nearby for claiming to be the Messiah. And I have no doubt Jairus had already warned his synagogue to to avoid this, this traveling carpenter, this false teacher at all costs. But something's changed, right? Something's different now. Something's moved his feelings in a different direction about Jesus. Here it is. He has a 12 year old daughter his only daughter, and she's dying. Well, Matthew's account records that that she had already died, but keep in mind Matthew is condensing the story into one conversation. Luke is spreading it out and giving us a fuller account. I imagine the crowd watches in stunned silence here as Jairus falls down at the feet of Jesus. Let me tell you, this is an act of desperation. Jesus is his his last, his only hope. Jesus evidently agrees to go with him to his home, but as they walk along, they're surrounded by this this crowd of people all packed in, and now we're introduced to a second hopeless person. Here in verse 43, we read, And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years, and though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. Mark's gospel account adds something that that, uh, Dr. Luke doesn't record. Mark writes in chapter 5 and verse 26 that she had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. Well, I can imagine Luke, Dr. Luke saying, thanks a lot for that, Mark. Well, Luke does tell us that she's experienced 12 years of a rather unique desperation. He calls her disease a discharge of blood, apparently related to menstruation, which never completely stopped. Now, by the time of Christ, any woman with such an ailment was was superstitiously connected to immorality, and, and that wasn't necessarily true. But she would have then been considered ceremonially unclean and forbidden to enter the synagogue. Let me tell you, this, in, th- this woman is a lonely, hopeless case. Now, at this point, these two lives intersect, this woman and the synagogue ruler. Now, just think for a moment how different they are. He's a leader of the synagogue. She is unable to worship in the synagogue. 
He has a wonderful reputation. She's lost her reputation. He's, he's had 12 years of, of happiness. She's had 12 years of sadness. But they have this one thing in common. They are both hopeless cases. They're both desperate. And Jesus is their only hope. Luke writes here in verse 44, She came up behind him, that is Jesus, and touched the fringe of his garment. Now get this. The garment here is a rectangular cloth. It had blue fringe or blue tassels attached at the corners. It would be slung over the shoulder of a God-fearing Jewish man, especially a teacher or rabbi in these days. And it represented his personal commitment to the law of God. So this woman reaches out and literally clutches one of these blue tassels dangling off the back shoulder of Jesus. Now, because she's unclean, she's forbidden by the law to touch other people. So this isn't just an act of desperation. You need to understand this is an act of faith. Why? She knows she has not been unfaithful to the law of God. She's not hiding immorality. She's essentially now throwing herself on the mercy of God in having kept the law. And what happens? She's immediately healed. Verse 44 says, immediately her discharge of blood ceased. In other words, she can feel the healing power of of Christ coursing through her body. And with that, she lets go of that tassel and tries to slip away unnoticed. But Jesus stops here in verse 45. He says, who was it that touched me? And Peter replies, master, the crowds surround you and are pressing in on you. We'll leave it to Peter to effectively say, Lord, are you kidding? Who hasn't touched you? Well, Jesus says here in verse 46, someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. You see, Jesus knew the difference between being touched accidentally and being touched intentionally. And verse 47 records what happens next. When the woman saw that she was not hidden, She came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. Jesus' response is tender, compassionate. Verse 48, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. You see, faith had brought her to Jesus seeking healing, and she's healed. But this phrase here, you've been made well, is from the Greek word that means saved. In other words, she wanted to be healed, but because of her faith in Christ, she is now saved forever. Now, don't forget, she's been excommunicated from the synagogue for 12 years. And who happens to be standing nearby but the ruler of the synagogue? See, Jesus knew who touched him, but by calling her forward and announcing her cleansing, she can return to the synagogue and worship the Lord, and Jairus can be her witness. Well, now back to Jairus. While Jesus is still speaking to the woman, verse 49 says that someone arrives from his home telling him, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. Oh my, this this particular delay in his mind has cost him the life of his daughter, and it's now too late. Well, not quite. Jesus responds in verse 50, Do not fear, only believe, and she will be well. Now, when they arrive, Jesus moves past all those professional mourners who've already gathered to earn their pay by weeping. Jesus arrives and makes it into the room where the little girl lay dead. Verse 54 records what happens. Taking her by the hand, he called, saying, child, arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up at once, and her parents were amazed. But he charged them to tell no one what had happened. Jesus apparently doesn't want his resurrection power to take center stage in this encounter, and frankly, we're not told why. Well, the leader of the synagogue, he's hoping that Jesus can heal his daughter 
But now because of the delay, he realizes that Jesus has power over the grave. Isn't it interesting that delays are often doorways into greater uh, discoveries about God? Have you found it true in your own life that some of the deepest truths you discover in Scripture are truths you discover while you're waiting and trusting in the Lord? Perhaps you're facing a hopeless situation today. Maybe you're desperate for something to happen. Perhaps the Lord has allowed this moment of desperation to invite you into a deeper understanding of him. Maybe maybe he's brought you to this, this hopeless moment to reveal that he's not only your last option, he's your only option. Well, let me encourage you to turn to him and trust in him and wait for him today. Well, until our next journey, beloved, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.